Welcome to Helpline 3, I'm Jade Balexa. The leading cause of cancer deaths in the United States is lung cancer. That's according to the American Lung Association. You don't have to smoke to get this type of cancer. Exposure to radon or air pollution can put you at risk. Today we are talking to pulmonary and critical care specialist Dr. Ahmed Varani of Willis Knighton Health System. And Dr. Varani, thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. So we are also taking your questions at 318-219-4569. So get those phones a ringing. And tell us, what are the risk factors for lung cancer? Well, the most important risk factor that we can modify in our lives is smoking. Uh, as you said earlier, that's not the only risk factor, but it's a major risk factor. Um, so that's one thing that I always advise my patients to be weary of. Uh, there's also other risk factors like environmental exposures. Uh, if you go to certain areas where there's a lot of air pollution, this can increase your chances. If you have a family history of lung cancer, that can put you at risk for developing it down the line. And then there's some people that end up getting lung cancer without a lot of those things. And for those, you know, we do uh, what we can to help treat them. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about smoking. <clears throat> How can people quit smoking? I mean, I would imagine you advise that if someone comes to your office. Right. First and foremost, I always tell my patients it's hard. Uh, we understand smoking is difficult to, to kick. Um, there are things we can do to help. There are certain medications that we can prescribe. We can give you nicotine replacement therapy. Now, that's the addictive part of cigarettes is the nicotine. Uh, we can put you on a standard dose of medications to help the urges go away. Um, similar to, to therapy, there's uh, group settings where you can go and, and talk to other people who are going through the same struggles to quit smoking. Um, so we, we'd like to take a multidisciplinary approach on that. Mm -hmm. And let me ask you this while, while you're here, what do you think about vaping? Vaping is interesting. Um, you know, there's, it's newer. Uh, you know, just like when cigarettes first came to be, we didn't have a lot of uh, information on the downstream effects of it at the time. And I think similar to vaping, we are learning more and more, and I think our younger population is, is turning to it. Now, uh, it's hard for me as a lung doctor to say it's okay to vape or do these things, and uh, you know, my advice is always to avoid all inhalation uh, as able to. But Currently, we're still in the in the phase of discovering what effects vaping can have on you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how can someone decrease their risk of lung cancer? The biggest modifiable risk factor uh, is really just avoiding exposures that we know increase your risk. Mm -hmm. Smoking, uh, you know, if there's poor air quality. Uh, outside of that, uh, you know, there's there's other things that aren't you know as proven but you know people will turn to just overall having general health uh, exercising controlling your diet I do think these things overall do play a role in just a healthy lifestyle mm -hmm. um, and but the smoking would be the biggest thing mm -hmm. and talk about screenings who should be screened for for lung cancer absolutely uh, you know lung cancer screening has come a long way uh, it was under recognized but in the last decade, we've, we've established great guidelines. Everybody's uh, is a little bit different, but the overall consensus is any, anywhere between the age of 50 to 55 up until 75 to 80 um, can qualify. And if it's someone who's been smoking for at least one pack a day for about 20 years or quit within the last 15 years, if they are in that age bracket with those qualifications, you can set them up for a lung cancer screening program. What that does is similar to how someone would get mammograms for breast cancer, you would get a CT scan of your chest at a lower dose uh, to look for uh, suspicious nodules and then these nodules, depending on their size, location, and their characteristics can further be either monitored or let's say uh, they're to the point where they deserve a biopsy or they need a biopsy, we can arrange for that too. Mm -hmm. And how do these often show up, the, the nodules in the lungs? So, you know, like uh, when you go to your doctor, the, the typical term is, oh, there's a spot on your mm -hmm. lung. And that's, for lack of better words, what it is, right? Your lung has, healthy lung tissue has some blood supply, some lymphatic circulation, and overall on CT scan, it just appears like a dark tissue. 
And then in between that, if you see rounded not nodule spots um, based on their size, they can be concerning for something that's developing that should not be there. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and then, uh, you know, when I was looking into this, a lot of times the, the lung cancer, there, there aren't symptoms. So how, how would you know, how would you know to get screened? That's excellent, and that's why we have these guidelines now. If you're in that age group, if you've been uh, using uh, uh, cigarette products, and just like you said, it being asymptomatic early on, that's actually when we want to focus on catching these and treating patients. Because if we can give them an early diagnosis, our treatment options are, are a lot more uh, effective and to, to a degree where we can even chase curative intent and we can just cure somebody of their lung cancer if it's caught early enough. Mm -hmm. So talk about the different types of lung cancer. Um, is there like a stage one, a stage two? There is. So when you initially are suspicious of something in your lungs, the, the way to diagnose this is to actually sample it. You have to get a tissue biopsy in, in most circumstances and that gets reviewed under a microscope and it tells you the characteristics of that, of that uh, finding. Now if it's, you know, maybe it's a benign spot, you had some exposure to something, or if it's a malignant cancerous spot. So based off of that, uh, we end up then doing more imaging. So once you diagnose somebody to have a primary lung cancer, the next step is to figure out, is this contained to this area or has it gone somewhere else? And there's other treatment, or there's other imaging that you can do to find this being somewhere else. If it is found somewhere else, then that increases your stage based on where it is. For instance, is it just in the lung? Is it gone into the lung and the lymph nodes in your chest? Or has it gone past that area? It can you know, go to your, your bone or your brain, and those treatment options are different. Mm -hmm. And we have Larry on the line right now. Good afternoon to you, Larry. What is your question? I was gonna ask, uh, I've had the CT scans done on my chest, and my doctor has diagnosed that I had lymph nodes on the or nodules on the outside of my lung I mean I mean he's been checking it every six months so apparently he says it's nothing to worry about now but you know it makes me worry mm -hmm. sure that's a that's a good question Larry thank you for calling and anybody would worry finding anything in the lungs now that's the one thing that we have to be cautious with with the screening programs because when you look for stuff you're going to find stuff and just because you find something that doesn't mean that's something to be worried about and it sounds like your doctor is doing a good job of keeping an eye on this by repeating your scans and, and time intervals and he's probably doing that to see if the characteristics of these nodules change it may be that some of them are smaller right now and they just want to make sure they stay that way because if it was cancer, the idea is it would be getting worse. So that's probably what he's doing and what I would suggest is having a sit down with your doctor and discussing these things with them because it sounds like they feel like it's at least been stable to some degree. Yeah, well, I mean, he mainly did it because I used to smoke, but I haven't smoked in over 15 years. But, I mean, I worked in the industrial environment so you know i've been around different things you know that make me concerned you know about freedom stuff is what had me worried right and that that's a very uh, uh reasonable concern and it could just be that you know we like our lungs take in everything we breathe like it's not just the the cigarettes but it's everything like i walk outside and there's pollen or there's dust and our lungs do a good job of trying to wall off things that aren't supposed to be there. It may very well have been that you inhaled something through the years of your work that now your lung is kind of walled off and it's just keeping it at bay. Um, but uh, like your doctor's doing, uh, keeping an eye on it is, is uh, very uh, important, especially with your history of smoking. Okay, well, I mean, I guess that's all I can do unless he finds where anything has changed. Yes, sir. Well, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Larry, for calling. We appreciate you. And you guys can uh, keep calling at 318-219-4569 with your questions.
And we have another caller on the line. Um, tell us your name and what is your question? Daisy, Daisy. Hi, Dr. Burr. Hey, Daisy. Um, is it, Hi. Tell us your question. Hey, Dr. Burr. My question is, at what point do you need to consider getting a screening CT scan for lung cancer? So when I see, that's a great question. When I first see my patients, I, I ask them a history. Um, are you of that age group that has uh, the risk factors? Uh, did you smoke for 20 years? Um, or have you quit in the last 15 years? If you meet those criteria, then I enroll them after my first visit. And that is what we call your baseline CT scan. So that's the first one we get. And then based off of what that finds, it gives you a risk profile. So you may be qualified, you may qualify as a low risk to where we repeat it every 12 months or there may be a small spot or nodule that's very small right now that because of your risk factors requires you to get uh, screening so to continue in the profile and based off that you can get it every three months, six months or back to 12 months and that can vary depending on the characteristics and how the nodule grows or doesn't grow and that's typically what I do with my patient population. Okay, thank you, doctor. Thank you, Daisy. Do you see a lot of lung cancer in our area? I do. Um, well, you know, a lot is a relative term. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a lung specialist, so the, the patients that I see typically have uh, lung issues. And a lot of their complaints are shortness of breath because they've had some exposures to something. So uh, when I do screen them, I do find a fair amount that have uh, these spots, so to speak, that just need to be monitored. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I do see a lot of other stuff too. So it's not just lung cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you, when you get CT scans, you may find something else that needs addressing as well. Okay, uh, what else do you find? Uh, you know, there's a lot of other diseases that affect the lungs. Like I said, the, the lungs are open to the world. So yes. may, you may just had a nodule that something you inhaled or, you know, some, we live in, we live in uh, Louisiana. There are certain fungal infections and certain, you know, uh, things we inhale that just kind of go into our lungs and and then become chronic and then there's nothing to do. So there's, there's a lot of different things you find. Mm -hmm. Interesting, so how do you treat lung cancer? I mean, what is, what do you do when you, when you find the nodules and it is indeed lung cancer? So the first step is to define the extent of your cancer and that's what dictates your treatment and to define what type it is. So, you know, modern medicine has come a long way uh, cancer treatment is also becoming more personalized uh, instead of a one-size-fits-all. There's uh, new technologies that can, that can uh, figure out what type of markers are on the cancer cells and try to attack them directly. Um, you know, some of my colleagues I work with at the willis Knighton Cancer Center do a great job of making sure they test for all these things uh, to make sure they give the most personalized uh, treatment plan to our patients. There are some surgical options in patients if they, if their lung cancer is found early enough and it's contained to a small area, um, that and if their lungs can tolerate resection, we have our uh, cardiothoracic colleagues at at Willis Knighton as well that help us out with that. And then there's so that's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is unfortunately your your malignancy and your cancer was found at a later stage. In which case you may not be a surgical candidate, but there are medications we can we can give you to help suppress a lot of these uh, overactive cells that shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. So there's two types of lung cancers, correct? Well, there's there's actually more than two, but okay. the big umbrella is what we call small cell and non-small cell, right. and then you go down the tree with that, and each one of them have their own different categories. Mm. Basically, it's a it's technical terms to 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 kind of specify what cell is overactive, so you can try to treat that origin of cell. Mm, okay, so. What, uh, what, is, what is the prognosis if, if someone has lung cancer? So uh, the prognosis will really be based on your initial staging. So if it's contained to one area, let's say it's a stage one or stage two, it hasn't spread anywhere, you have otherwise good lung function, then we can get it uh, surgically removed and that may be the end of it. And as long as, you know, obviously you get watched for recurrence, but 
that's a great prognosis. Yeah. If someone has something more advanced, let's say it's left your lungs, it's gotten into your brain, unfortunately, or other areas of your body, well, that may require more treatment to where surgery may not be an option, but it would be medication related. And then it would just depend on how well you're responding to the medications that are being given to you. And that's where it's important to, to work with the lung cancer specialist or the cancer specialist to figure out exactly what the best treatment option is for our, for our patient. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how, how do you increase awareness of, of lung cancer? How do you get the, the word out about it and make sure people know that the screenings are out there? Well, first and foremost, starting off here, yeah. uh, thank you for you know giving us the stage to do that. Uh, really, just reaching out to all our primary care doctors. You know, they play such an important role in our in our network and our system because they see a lot of these patients that I may not see because they have to come to me from somebody. So, spreading the word that hey, we do have guidelines now. We do have protocols in place. We have an entire lung cancer screening program. Um, you know, November is Lung Cancer Awareness Month, so just kind of getting the word out there uh, as much as we can is the first place to start. And I always advise patients to advocate for themselves, to ask these questions to their, to their doctors, whether it's their primary care or a lung specialist they're seeing, or any doctor for that matter. Just say, hey, can you refer me to somebody that could know more about this? Do I qualify for this? Do I need this? So really, it, it, it's a multi-team approach. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the different diseases besides lung cancer that the air pollution, the cigarette smoking can do to the lungs? Because like you said, I mean, what really struck me with what you said is that, you know, the lungs are taking all this in. Right. Um, so, you know, let's say you have been someone that smokes and uh, you don't have cancer, but you could also have lung disease in general. Uh, Typically, someone will have what we call COPD. I'm sure everyone has heard that, that term. And it is something we, we, we see in a lot of our patient populations with cancer and without. So with that, you know, we, we get them in, we put them on appropriate treatments, inhalers, we educate them on you know, trying to cut down their smoking or, or getting rid of it altogether. Um, really, it's about symptomatic management. Uh, we you know, try to prevent them from being uh, admitted to the hospital with exacerbations of these things. So, but it doesn't all have to be related to smoking. There's, like you said, air pollution and other things we inhale, and sometimes you'll see what we call little calcifications or granulomas, and these are also spots in the lungs, but it's typically something we inhaled that our lung just figure out a way to wall off, and it's, it's, it's you know, nothing you have to worry about. Mm -hmm. um, there may not be necessarily a treatment for that, but it's something you just you know about and you know it's there and that you just need to watch. Um, there's autoimmune diseases we'll find, uh, you know, that get triggered by environmental factors um, that we'll see on the CT scan and then we'll address that and do workups for that. So the lung, you know, is, is intimately connected to all of their, our body, like all the blood flows through there, through our heart, through our lungs. So, we, you know, there is a lot of other diseases that we need to keep an eye out for. Mm -hmm. So the, the lung cancer, is that usually something that happens over time or do, do you see young people get lung cancer? So um, as, you, as your age increases, your likelihood of developing cancer, if you have the appropriate risk factors, also increases you know, and now we're living to be longer. So, you know, that's every second, there's something going on in your body that needs to be done over and over again. So um, as we age, that's what our, our uh, chances do increase, especially if we've been smoking for a longer period of time. Now, things don't happen overnight, certainly. There is uh, a period of time where it starts small and it just kind of grows and it grows to itself. And it, you know, let's say it starts off at a number two or a size two and it can go to a four and a six and an eight. Our goal with this whole program is to catch these things early where it's small and easily addressable with all the treatments we have available. And that's why we're trying to increase the awareness. That's why we're trying to get uh, people to be aware that these things are available for them. Mm -hmm. And we have Tina on the line. Tina, what is your question for Dr. Varani? Hi, Dr. Varani, I have a question for you. What is the number one thing that a person can do to decrease their risk of lung cancer? 
That's an excellent question, and I think the best thing one person can do is avoid what we know is a risk factor for it, which is smoking. Um, you know, I hate to keep saying it over and over again, but it's something we know increases your risk. It's something we can uh, try to control, and if if patients need help doing that, we can give them the the options to do that too. So really, my my recommendation to all my patients is. I understand this is hard. Uh, I'm going to help you through this. We'll do this together. But let's figure out a way to get you to stop smoking. Mm -hmm. All right, Tina, thank you for calling. So, I mean, is this is this through medication to stop smoking? Is this with a patch? Or is this stopping cold turkey? I mean, are, are people able to do that? or is it is it just kind of weaning yourself off cigarettes i mean how does one quit so there's a lot of different ways to go about it my advice to patients is let me help you quit in whatever way you think is going to work the best for you uh, if you read some of the studies they've they've done going cold turkey seems to be the most chance of success but that's a very hard thing to do if someone's been smoking every day for 30 years and then tomorrow you ask them to completely stop that's not easy my advice is come to me and or your doctor and tell them you're ready to stop but you need help once you get to that state of mind that I want to do this I just need some help to do it we can give you things in a staged way for instance the the addictive part of cigarettes is nicotine so nicotine we can give you in small doses such as what you said the patch and the patch will throughout the day secrete secrete little amounts of nicotine which will help you from uh, getting that urge to smoke there's other medications out there i'm sure you've heard of like chentex um, it's a medication that suppresses your your desire to smoke and then while your desire is suppressed then you get off the physical uh, uh, addiction, and then with time, you can quit that way. Um, there's programs you can get enrolled in where you, you sit with other people. You'd be surprised just talking to other people that are going through the same struggles as you to, to quit this helps, and you, you develop a support system. For instance, I've been smoking a pack a day. I'm, I'm on one cigarette, and I don't want to do this at 7 p.m. I'm going to call my support person. I'm going to say, hey, let's just, can we talk? Mm -hmm. And You'd be surprised, five minutes of talking, you may not have that urge to have that cigarette Yeah, anymore. or maybe you forget about it. You forget about it. Oh, gosh, yeah. I bet that c that could help a lot. Hello, Sherry, thank you for calling. What is your question? Uh, yes, I would like to find out at what size a nodule has to be before you can biopsy it. That's a good question, mm -hmm. Sherry. Uh, it, typically, uh, it's it's not that easy to, to get to these nodules. Uh, if they're out in the, the what we call the periphery of the lung, we can go from the outside. If they're a little bit in the center, we can go from the inside. Um, I usually wait, or not wait, but we a lot of times have to wait until the nodule gets closer to about one centimeter before we can try to try to biopsy it. But we can go a little bit a little bit smaller than that too, but otherwise it's it's very hard to get to something that's so small. Let's say you have a half a centimeter nodule. That's a lot more difficult to accurately take a sample of and decrease your chances of what we call a false negative, where this could be something, but uh, you know, like we just didn't catch it. So that's why we do what we call these uh, screenings, and then once you have a screening, we, we watch you. So let's say you have uh, risk factors for, for uh, cancer and your lung nodule is six centimeters and you have the risk factors, well, what we would do is we would, in, we would check you within three months time. And in that three months time, if that nodule went to six millimeters, which is half a centimeter to let's say eight or nine millimeters, well, now we can just go take a sample of it, but it's still enough time to where it hasn't get run wild, so to speak. It's still contained in that area and we can still have the same treatment options that we would have if it was at six millimeters versus eight millimeters. So th you, to, to answer your question, typically closer to one centimeter, but anywhere between eight millimeters to a centimeter, we can, we can, try, to, we can try to biopsy it. But technology is increasing. Uh, you know, we, we have different robotic bronchoscopies now that we're setting up with Willis Knighton. So once all of that goes, the, the, the ability for us to get smaller nodules will increase which ends up being our goal overall so we can diagnose them early. Yes, sir. Uh, let me ask you one more thing. Um, when a nodule grows from two 
to five millimeters in, say, a year. Is that a bad sign? Well, uh, not necessarily a bad sign. Uh, what it does tell us is that it took 12 months for it to go from a very small two millimeters to five millimeters, right? And these millimeters are, we're talking about like the tip of a pen is what we're talking about so here, small. right? So because it did change in size, it, that, what that tells us is we may not need to do something right now, but we do need to keep an eye on it. If it keeps getting bigger, then we may need to do something. Well, what if it just stays at five millimeters? That means that it was just a little process that we can keep an eye on. And you know, when you're talking about millimeters, I mean, that's so tiny to where something going from two millimeters to five millimeters is not as exaggerated as something going from two millimeters to five centimeters. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, we're getting some good questions here. Okay, so, um, yeah, it's always good to keep a, keep a watch it on is. yourself. It is. Especially with, with uh, lung cancer and um, any, any small, small thing in your lungs. Okay, so let's get back to talking about prevention. And, um, yeah, we were talking about how to quit smoking because that obviously is a, is a big cause of, of lung cancer. Um, what else can we do? I think overall living a healthy lifestyle is it's going to make you feel better no matter what uh you know it, it's lung cancer is not the only thing we deal with there's different types of cancers there's different types of heart disease kidney disease so my advice to patients is always one good decision leads to another so if you've decided to quit smoking or you've decided to uh, go down the pathway of a healthy lifestyle overall your body's going to appreciate that more and you know every part of the body works closely with every other part of the body so if you're doing something to help one part, chances are you're doing something to help other parts too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just outside of uh, quitting smoking, it's, you know, living a healthy lifestyle, exercising, eating a well-balanced diet, um, you know, just decreasing the stress in your lives, things like that all do end up helping a person just be, just do better. Mm -hmm, exactly. Okay, so if, if people wanna reach you, I have the address here. Um, do you want to read it? <laughs> uh, sure. It's uh, 2508 Burt Coons Industrial Loop Suite 311 uh, in Shreveport, Louisiana, 71118. Uh, phone number to our clinic is 318-212-5764. Okay. And so do people usually need a, a reference to see you or, or how does that work? Typically, uh, your primary care doctor can refer you to our clinic, but a lot of times if you just call and you want to be seen by us, we can help you. Uh, get in touch with your primary care doctor or, or guide you on how to appropriately do that um, to make sure that your insurance and everything can, can go through and we can just have your old records and paperwork. But mm -hmm. if you were to call the clinic, we can, we can work to, to get you in uh, as soon as possible. Okay. And would someone come see you if they feel like they want to be screened for lung cancer? Absolutely. Um, we're, 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 you know, starting a lung cancer screening program, a nodule clinic. So anyone that fits that criteria, if they want to get lung cancer screening en enrolled in the program, we are more than happy to do that. Actually, we would be, we would be very happy to do that. Mm -hmm. And quitting smoking, now is the time to do that, especially in November. It is, absolutely. It's never, it's never too late to stop. Mm -hmm, exactly. No matter your age, it's, it's time because the, your, your lungs clear, right? Or they start to clear when you, when you stop smoking? Yeah, you'd be surprised that after a few weeks of stopping smoking, how much better people just feel overall, not mm -hmm. just from lungs, but their overall body in general. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, it's been great having you on today. Thank You've you. You've provided so much insight to, to things I'm, I'm learning about lung cancer. So it's, it's, it's been great. And our callers have been so helpful today with their questions. And we appreciate you guys as always. And thank you for watching this edition of Healthline 3. And we actually have another edition tomorrow. So we'll see you then.